the Newman Center. St. Thomas Aquinas, the patron of this chapel, was a remarkable man with a towering intellect. St. Thomas Aquinas became known as the Angelic Doctor in order to express his well-known purity of heart and doctrine of the angels. He surpassed everyone in learning and virtue. He was a philosopher, scientist, mystic, theologian, and scriptural commentator. He managed to interpret his vast secular university studies within the context of our holy Catholic faith. But above all, he was a saint. His only desire was to love God above all things and his neighbor as himself. It is for these reasons that we urgently need to rediscover the life and teachings of this great saint here at the university. We are most especially honored to have Father Peter Cameron, Dominican, to inaugurate this new lecture series, which will continue with the celebration on a yearly basis of the Eucharist in honor of our patron, St. Thomas, a man whose sanctity was a consequence of his deep love for the bread of angels, our Lord Jesus Christ. And we heard that because many of the hymns that we sung this evening were written by him. Dominican Father Peter John Cameron was ordained a priest in 1986. He grew up near Hartford, Connecticut. He holds a licentia in sacred theology with a specialty in New Testament theology and also a Master of Fine Arts degree in playwright. He began teaching homiletics and preaching in St. Joseph Seminary, Dunwoody, the major seminary for the Archdiocese of New York, and in 1994, where he is presently the chairman of the department. He taught homiletics at the Dominican House of Studies in Washington, and Immaculate Conception Seminary in Huntington, New York, and also at the North American College in Rome. He served for two terms as the director of preaching for his Dominican province. For two years, he was also the spiritual director of the Minor Seminary at Dunwoody. In the early 1990s, he served as the director of campus ministry at New York University in Greenwich Village, New York. In 1998, he founded Blackfriars Repertory Theater, a small theater company operated by his Dominican province that produces plays each year in New York City. He is the artistic director of Blackfriars. Father Cameron has written a number of books, including one on homiletics entitled Why Preach, one, of the, one on the love of God entitled Made for Love, Loved by God, a book on the Blessed Virgin Mary entitled Mysteries of the Virgin Mary, and devotional books including Jesus Present Before Me, Meditations for Eucharistic Adoration. He is the founding editor-in-chief of Magnificat, a post he has held for 19 years. Brothers and sisters, let us give a warm welcome to Father Peter John Cameron. Just a few weeks ago, in November 2016, the legendary Canadian poet and Canadian Hall of Fame inductee Leonard Cohen died. Cohen was also a celebrity songwriter, and you probably know him best from his famous 1984 song, Hallelujah, which has been covered by artists more than 300 times and was a featured song in the movie Shrek. That's how I came to love it. <laughs> Among uh, another popular Grammy Award winning Canadian singer, considers the point of that song to be about, as she puts it, the struggle between having human desire and searching for spiritual wisdom. It's being caught between those two places. This is very interesting because Leonard Cohen was also famous for being terribly melancholic. He has been called the poet laureate of pessimism. His first studio album was dubbed The Suicide Songbook. His poignant lyrics are especially dark and grim, even though he claimed that he was no more depressed than anyone else. All the same, there exists one beautiful song of Leonard Cohen's that, although probably much less known, is even more profound and actually hopeful. It may be even fair to call it a hymn. The title of the song is Come Healing, and it goes, Oh, gather up the brokenness and bring it to me now, the fragrance of those promises you never 
dare to vow. The splinters that you carry, the cross you left behind, come healing of the body, come healing of the mind. And let the heavens hear it, the penitential hymn, come healing of the spirit, come healing of the limb. Behold the gates of mercy in arbitrary space, and none of us deserving the cruelty or the grace. O solitude of longing, where love has been confined, come healing of the body, come healing of the mind. O see the darkness yielding that tore the light apart, come healing of the reason, come healing of the heart. O troubled dust, concealing an undivided love, the heart beneath is teaching to the broken heart above. Let the heavens falter, let the earth proclaim, come healing of the altar, come healing of the name. And let the heavens hear it, the penitential hymn, come healing of the spirit, come healing of the limb. There it is again, the struggle between having human desire and the searching for spiritual wisdom. And who is the person doing the speaking in that song? It doesn't take deep analysis to realize that the speaker is God. Oh, gather up the brokenness and bring it to me now. Let the heavens hear it, the penitential hymn. Behold the gates of mercy. Oh, see the darkness yielding. Come healing of the reason, come healing of the heart. In effect, what Leonard Cohen's song is asking for is to meet St. Thomas Aquinas. Because probably nobody in the history of the Christian faith has understood and articulated better the healing of the reason and the healing of the heart. For St. Thomas Aquinas, the struggle between having human reason and searching for spiritual wisdom are not at all two places where we are caught. They are rather one person who is caught up in love for us, Jesus Christ, who blesses us with these longings precisely to set us free. St. Thomas Aquinas was a wonder, a force of nature. Thomas' first biographer, a man who knew Thomas personally, William of Tocco, wrote, In his lectures, Thomas raised new questions and discovered a new and clear way of solving them, and he used new arguments in arriving at these solutions. Those who heard Thomas Aquinas resolving difficulties and problems in a new way, with new principles, believed that he had been endowed by God with a new light of understanding. Thomas Aquinas was a genius in a sense held by the French writer Maurice Barres. A genius is one who can give us what we need when nobody else can do it. According to a modern biographer, Thomas went below the foundations of his own age and found the eternal principles of things. The 13th century poet Heinrich von Würzburg remarked about Thomas Aquinas, he could have discovered philosophy anew if it had been destroyed by fire. <laughs> he could have restored it in a better way. Can that new light of understanding of Thomas Aquinas somehow make a significant contribution to the intellectual life of Catholic University students today. His whole life, it seems, St. Thomas was poised to do just that. Thomas was born to a noble family in 1225 in the family castle of Roccasecca near Naples, Italy. His father, Count Landolf, was a relative of the Holy Roman Emperor, Frederick Barbarossa. His mother, Countess Theodora of Teano, was related to the Norman barons. At the age of five, Thomas was brought to the nearby monastery of Monte Cassino, where his uncle Cinebald was the abbot. In the words of one of Thomas' best respected modern biographies, 
the sacred solitude of the holy mountain of Casino may have permanently influenced the susceptible heart of the ideally minded boy, and may have developed in him his bent for reflection, contemplation, and the inner life. But it was not a life without trials. His ambitious father had set his sights on Thomas taking over as abbot of Monte Cassino. He even engineered a way for him to do it without Thomas having to become a Benedictine. Moreover, when his worldly mother discovered that her son had opted to join the Dominican order instead of the Benedictines, a huge step down on the social scale, she arranged for Thomas's brothers to kidnap him and hold him prisoner in one of the family castles. Even locked in a tower, Thomas wouldn't budge. So the brothers hired a prostitute and threw the woman into the room with Thomas, hoping that she would persuade him. It didn't work. At long last, the family relented and allowed Thomas to proceed to his studies with St. Albert the Great. But if all of this wasn't stigma enough, in the classroom, he fell prey to the bullies of his day. As G.K. Chesterton explains in his biography of Thomas Aquinas, it is clear before long, even his imposing stature began to have only the ignominious immensity of the big boy left behind in the lowest form. He was called the dumb ox. He was the object not merely of mockery, but of pity. On occasion, Thomas was made to feel like a bit of a freak, owing to his great girth. The mother of Thomas's secretary and right-hand man, the holy brother Reginald of Paperno, recounts that when Thomas was passing, the peasants in the field left their labors and came to look at him, full of admiration for a man of such corpulence and beauty. <laughs> Perhaps it was out of a mild sense of defensiveness that St. Thomas went on to write, Pulcritudo propriae consistit in corpore magno. Beauty is found in a large body. <laughs> what we are sure of is this. The many troubles that Thomas was forced to face did not weaken his resolve to follow Jesus Christ as a Dominican friar but only deepened his desire. And for St. Thomas Aquinas, desire is everything. The sadness that Thomas Aquinas may have experienced over being misunderstood and rejected by his own family, mistreated by his schoolmates, and feeling self-conscious about his personality and bearing would have affected him a lot. In his teachings, St. Thomas notes that of all the passions, the four basic ones being sadness, joy, hope, and fear, it is sadness, he says, that causes the most injury to the soul. Maybe he personally felt the threat of that. But because he was a thoughtful and reflective person, Thomas turned his hurt into something constructive, constructive that led him to wonder, what is sadness? And the ingenious conclusion Thomas came up with is this. Sadness is the desire for an absent good. He made it his life's goal to go after this absent good because the human desire for joy is stronger than the fear of sadness. Thomas learned this the hard way. One night, when Thomas Aquinas was a little boy, he was sleeping alongside his nurse, and his baby sister was sleeping in the nursery with them. A thunderstorm erupted in the middle of the night. The infant was struck by lightning and died. But Thomas was spared. A contemporary biographer of Thomas Aquinas writes, Remembering, no doubt, that the, the episode when his young sister had been killed by lightning as he slept by her side, Thomas had the pious habit 
of making the sign of the cross during thunderstorms and repeating, God came in the flesh. God came to suffer for us. A calamitous happening like that might cause some to despair and give up. For Thomas Aquinas, it produced enlightenment that moved him to keep going. As he would later write, despair, like hope, presupposes desire. Neither hope nor desire is directed towards anything that does not move our that does not that, that does not move our desire. In fact, St. Thomas is never more eloquent, more lyrical, more romantic than when he is speaking about hope. Hope like smoke from the fire of love mounts up from life and vanishes in glory. St. Thomas Aquinas instructs us, there is no desire that is not directed towards a good. A natural desire cannot possibly be vain and senseless. No, our desires are given to us with the intention of leading us to the one who gave them to us in the first place. Our desires are given to us so that we can understand the purpose for which we are living. Desires are given precisely so that we can know who Jesus is and just how much he can fill our lives with total satisfaction. Desires are given to us so that we can share in the happiness of the one who created us. Desires are not to be feared or repressed. They are to be embraced. St. Thomas says in his masterpiece, the Summa Theologica, every person's life consists in the affection that principally sustains them and in which they find their greatest satisfaction. The moment we dare to go to the root of our desires and find that affection that principally sustain us, sustains us, we want what St. Thomas Aquinas wants. A story is told about a time when Jesus miraculously from a crucifix spoke to St. Thomas. The Lord was pleased with what Thomas had written about him regarding his passion and death, and the Lord wanted to reward him. When Jesus asked Thomas Aquinas what he wanted for his reward, Thomas replied, Non nisi te, Domini. Nothing but you, Lord. To speak about that in which we find our greatest satisfaction <coughs> is to speak about the truth. This is a topic Pope St. John Paul II addresses so powerfully in his encyclical letter, Fides et Ratio, Faith and Reason. He says, one may define the human being as one who seeks the truth. The thirst for truth is so rooted in the human heart that to be obliged to ignore it would cast our existence into jeopardy. The desire for truth spurs reason always to go further. At the summit of its searching, reason acknowledges that it cannot do without what faith presents. And what do you think John Paul goes on to talk about next after saying that? He talks about Thomas Aquinas. The Pope continues, Thomas recognized that faith has no fear of reason, but seeks it out and has trust in it. Just as grace builds on nature and brings it to fulfillment, so faith builds upon and perfects reason. Illumined by faith, reason is set free. This is why the church has been justified in consistently proposing St. Thomas as a master of thought. Here's the humility with which Thomas Aquinas looked at reality. He says in his Summa Contra Gentiles, human beings are ordained by divine providence towards a higher good than human fragility can experience in the present life. That is why it was necessary for the human mind to be called to something higher than human reason here and now can reach, so that it would thus learn to desire something and with zeal tend towards something that surpasses 
the whole state of the present.